Good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you to the CD Spring Conference this year. My name is Rolf Stadler. I'm a professor at KTH, and I'm uh, a CDS faculty. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, talk about the lo logistics of the day and go with you through the program, and uh, then hand over to uh, Professor Pondus Jonsson, the director of CDS. So, this is the, the conference in the morning. Uh, uh, I'm going to hand, hand over to uh, Pontus in, 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 in a minute. Pontus Jones from KTH and uh, co-director David Olgard from Vosvarsmarkten. Then at 9.45 we have the keynote by Professor Be uh, Benoit Baudry. He's going to talk about software, software supply chains. Uh, then we're going to have a break, uh, get a little bit of coffee. Then we have uh, two presentations about ongoing uh, CDS research, one by Roberto Guanciale uh, uh, on proof of security, and one by Elena Dubova on extracting secrets from electronic chips. Then we have lunch. Right. Now, you see here I wrote posters and demos, and uh, we actually have a poster and demo program, which you see here. By the way, the program I showed to you, I sent out yesterday evening via email to all people who have registered, so basically you should, you should have that. Uh, we have 12 poster stations. Um, these poster stations are going to be in, in, the, in uh, uh, the, uh, the glass corridor. If you, if you leave this building to the right 20 meters, just behind the tent, uh, you can see the glass corridor with, with these stations. They are manned by, mostly by doctoral students who are involved in, in projects, in ongoing projects that we do here at, at CDS, or, that are, or these, uh, these are projects that are related to CDS. And I would very much to uh, encourage you to go to these people and uh, talk to them, let them explain what they are doing, and so you can have a more in-depth and more personalized discussion. So go to Annika Andreasson, she's going to talk to you about situation awareness. Uh, uh, go to Markus schmidt Bjorgerson, and he's going to talk about confidential computation to you. Uh, we have two demos, as I said, if you want to see a, de a demo on attack simulation, Victor Engström is going to show that to you, or Kim Hammer is going to show a demo on, on intrusion response against dynamic attackers, and so on. Take advantage of this. Uh, we have the demo program active during the morning break, 30 minutes, and also during the lunch break. So the idea is grab a coffee, uh, go to the posters that, that are of interest to you, and talk to people. That gives you a, a flavor of, uh, of the type of research that, that's going on here and can, can be much more personalized than the type of uh, presentations we give here. All right, so I was uh, talking uh, uh, about the morning. This is what we're going to see in the afternoon. There's a second keynote. Um, Jamie Collier from Mandiant is going to talk about uh, advanced persistent threats. Then we have uh, two research presentations, one by Virgil Gligor from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh uh, on determining an economic value of high assurance for commodity software security. Um, a long title, it's going to take 30 minutes probably to, to fully understand what, what he, he means, but he's, a, he's an excellent speaker, so you're going to enjoy the talk. And then we have uh, Musar Balieu, faculty here at KTH, uh, prototyping the attack and, and so on. Uh, after a short break in the afternoon, we have the panel. The panel is organized and moderated by da David Olgard. And you see here the panelist. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the pen is about bug bounty, uh, very, very, uh, very, uh, uh, very current topic. And the panelists, Camilla Lundahl, uh, Mats Ögren, Sandra Boruta, and again, Virgil Ligor. Right. After the closing, we have a reception. Uh, maybe I should say all the coffee break and lunch 
uh, they're going to be happening or uh, uh, going to gonna, uh, give it to you in, in the white tent that you saw when, when, when you came in. And also the, the reception at the end, so the idea is uh, you, you have uh, at the end of the day sitting through all these presentations, uh, uh, you deserve a glass of wine or a glass of, uh, a glass of juice and maybe, maybe talk things over with, with, uh, with somebody you met here. Uh, I think in Swedish it's called mingle, no? There's no event without a mingle, so this is going to be our mingle at the end. All right, so this is the, the program, this is the day for today. Uh, anybody have a question or a comment? Is this not the case? Then we would start, I would ask uh, Pontus Jonsson, director of, uh, of CDIS, to start his presentation. And his presentation is on my laptop, and I bring it up now. Pontus. Thank you. All right, it's uh, fantastic to see all you people here to, uh, to uh, visit us at CITIES. So I will start by motivating, trying at least to motivate, why CDs at all exists. And uh, then I will hand over to David, who will uh, explain or give, a, give an overview of what CDs is and what we do here. So I thought I'd start this, this um, motivation by uh, introducing these three guys. Uh, many of you I think, know about the NSO group, founded by these three, three Israeli gentlemen. Two of them, at least, are from the intelligence community in Israel. They are very, very well known in the cybersecurity community for the uh, Pegasus software that, uh, that this company has created, which is a spyware um, that can be used to infiltrate uh, mainly mobile devices, and um, um, eavesdrop on, on the targets of, of this um, software, Pegasus software. And so the NSO group, they've, um, a lot has leaked about who, who they've been targeting. All is pretty murky here, but uh, it appears that Something maybe up to 50,000 people have been on their targeting lists. Uh, President Emmanuel Macron, for instance. Not clear exactly how many have actually been successfully compromised, but, but it seems like uh, indications are that a great many of these have been successfully compromised. So, the journalists, activists, academics, and uh, lawyers, and all kinds of people who you would not want to be eavesdropped on by some foreign state. So typically it's a foreign state, some state, that, uh, some government that uh, procures these, these tools and services from the NSO group. Uh, one of the most well, uh, one, one of the most well published um, targets was Yamal Khashoggi, a Saudi Arabian journalist who was subsequently murdered. Um, so this this software, the Pegasus software, uh, we really would not want to have that. Um, and it only works because the NSO group has been very capable at exploiting vulnerabilities in software. In particular, they've been targeting iPhones. And they've been using a series of exploits. But uh, I thought we'd dive a little bit into one that's uh, recently, quite recently, been analyzed. It's called Forced Entry. It was discovered by Citizen Lab, and it's been, uh, it's been, uh, in, it's been analyzed by um, the Google Project Zero team, which is a very competent team. So when NSO wants to with the Pegasus software, infect an iPhone. They target the iPhones, in this case, with forced entry, the iMessage system. And this is the text messaging system of the iPhones. The, you can send text messages, 
but you can also send images. And among the images that you can send are GIF images, and then you can send these animated images. And Apple thought that when, you, when the iPhone receives one of these animated images, it shouldn't just play once, it should loop endlessly. So there's some code in the iMessage system that tries to achieve this endless looping. It seems to me like it's a very trivial functionality. You really don't need that. And it turned out that this functionality was uh, they, where they found this, this, this vulnerability that eventually allowed NSO Group to compromise uh, systems um, at will. And these compromises are they're called zero-click. So sometimes you need the user to interact, click on a link, or do something uh, for, for an exploit to work. A zero-click exploit, that's the, the finest of exploits. The target doesn't have to do anything. And so all you need here is a telephone number or an iMessage uh, account to target. So the way it works is that there's, um, the NSO group sends a file that's called, uh, that has the file ending .gif. This is received by the iMessage system. It looks at this file ending, it says .gif, okay, this is a gif, and then it sends it over, because it wants to do this endless loop, it sends it over to copy it. It uses something called imgifutils to copy gifs. And this function, copy gif from path to destination path. Uh, that in turn uses Core Graphic, which is a library, and Core Graphics, it doesn't care about the file extension. It can read lots of different file formats, and it parses those formats. It doesn't care about the file extension, so it doesn't look at the .gif. Instead, it looks inside the file and sees, okay, this is a GIF, and it's going to do something. But the thing that NSO Group did was, which is not a common hacker trick, they called it .gif, but in actuality, it was a PDF. And that way, they were able to trick the core graphics um, device or library to use its PDF decoder. And when it reached the PDF decoder, the PDF decoder, it found inside of this uh, PDF, it found this really arcane file format, the file format that's called the JBIG2. I would imagine that few of you have heard of the JBIG2 file format because it's used, it, used, it was used in the 1990s in printers and copying machines. It's not used today. But Core Graphics can read this file format, although nobody ever uses it. And by using the JBIG compression in the PDF that they called a .gif, in a file called something .gif, they were able to target this uh, this uh, XPDF JBIG2 parser. And this is a piece of code where they had found a vulnerability. So they kind of tricked their way into this system, and then this is a piece of code with 100,000 lines of code. Uh, here is the vulnerable part. And at one point, this file that is received, some part of it needs to be allocated, to written to memory. And when you write something to memory in C++, which is the language that was used here, then you first have to allocate memory. You have to allocate a buffer of a certain size, and then you fill it with your data. And uh, uh, what the NSO group had found was a vulnerability that's called an integer overflow. And uh, so this numsys defines the size of the buffer. Numsys, it's a 32-bit uh, unsigned integer. It can only be this big. There's, there's, an end, there's an end to how large that number can be. If you send an object that's even bigger than that, which the NSO group did, then it's going to reset, just like a clock. You reach 12, and then you drop down to zero, and then you start from there. So that means that what they were able to do was that they were able to create a small buffer because of the reset due to the integer overflow. But they had this huge amount of data that was the actual size of the object to be copied. And then C++ obediently just copies all that data into a far too small buffer. That's a buffer overflow. And when that happens, that means that a lot of data is going to be written not where it was supposed to be written. And if you spend a lot of time, like the NSO group did, on heap grooming and other techniques, then you may be able to 
specifically decide on what to write where outside of the buffer. And if you're lucky, you can find somewhere where you can write something that allows you to take control over the program execution. And this is exactly what happened. So this then is uh, the vulnerability. The vulnerability is easy to fix. All you have to do is an if statement, and that was uh, subsequently added. This if statement says, if the object is too big, just don't do it. So it's super simple to fix this, if you just, if you just know about the vulnerability. So if we just take a moment now and we think about what is the... So this is one of you know, many, many, many vulnerabilities. What is the root of this problem? Why does this vulnerability appear? And I would like to claim that the root, of course, there's somebody who wrote this piece of code. And that somebody obviously didn't write that if statement. So we can, we can, we can, uh, we can explore who that person is, and it's Derek Nunberg. Derek Nunberg, he likes to play drums, Japanese drums. He makes his own homemade cider press. He used to be a grad student at, at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, he also, in 1996, he wrote a paper on the discovery of bugs in software. So he has a certain interest in, in bugs, or used to have at least. He developed the XPDF PDF reader parser. He started with that in 1995. This is an open source project. So Apple, they just took this open source project. The NSO group, they thought that this was pretty great because it's an open source project. That means that you can read the code. You don't have to read binary code, but you can read the, the code of XPDF. And it's much easier to find bugs. Um, so Derek Nunberg, he ought to have written that if statement. But you know, Derek, he needs to know. He needs to know a lot of things. He needs to know well about C++, which is the language that he wrote this is in. He needs to know about Linux and Windows and iOS operating systems it's running on. He needs to understand a lot about PDFs, of course, because it's a PDF parser. And he needs to know about stuff like the JBIG2 parser. Nobody knows about this almost, but Derek, he needs to know that. He needs to know, of course, about the 100,000 lines of codes that he's been writing since 1995. He needs to have a good grasp of that. And he needs to know about integer overflow. He needs to know that these kind of vulnerabilities can happen and how to protect against them. And an integer overflow is just one vulnerability, one kind of vulnerability. In the background here, you can see a list of all the different kinds of vulnerabilities uh, and errors that you can make as a programmer when you write C++ code. So he needs to know about all those things also. And then he's not allowed to make any mistakes. So, but you know, it's just Derek. It's this guy. He's a normal person. I mean, he's an excellent guy, uh, but he's just a person. And so I would argue that the problem here is cognitive complexity, that this problem is just too big for any human being's head. You cannot ask, you cannot expect Derek to be able to write uh, code that doesn't have these vulnerabilities. He, nobody can. And of course, Derek, he's just this one guy. If you take an iPhone, then you have um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, just like Derek, who have been writing all the other code that might be targeted in a device like this. I mean, Derek's piece is minuscule, it's, it's nothing. And so there's so much more that code that is just like that. So I would say that the root cause, if we, if we were able to fix this problem, then we would, we would solve most of the cybersecurity issues that we have in society. Um, so I think there are two ways that you could solve the problem. One way is that you build systems that are so small that people like Derek and all the other developers, that they really, really understand everything about the, the code they write. 
But we know that to do that, you're going to have to shrink these systems so that they become, you know, this is just 100,000 lines of code. There are millions and millions of lines of code in this, uh, hundreds of millions of lines of code in this. Um, but 100,000 is far too big. So you have to, it has to be like 1,000 lines of code for Derek, or maybe, maybe 10,000 lines of code. Uh, so, so we're going to lose all the functionality that we are depending on in our digital infrastructure if we go that route. So it's not going to happen. We're not going to shrink these systems to that size where we can understand them. So the other option, the only, I think, other option is that we give Derek and all these developers better tools and methods for developing secure software. I think this is the only way that we can solve the problem. So we need you know, new programming languages and new operating systems and uh, you know, new development uh, environments and uh, analysis tools, verification tools. We need lots of help. It's like asking construction workers to build a skyscraper and giving them just a shovel and a sledgehammer. With those tools, you're not going to be able to do it. But if you have good tools, you might. The problem with this, though, is that, that uh, it's going to take a long time. So, so well, I can say firstly then that, so this is part one of the motivation for why cities exists and why research and innovation is important in cybersecurity. I don't think that we're ever going to solve this problem in any other way. Now, it's not, I wouldn't say that it's certain that we will solve it in this way either, but I don't see that there's any other way. Um, and the big problem with this approach is that it's going to take a long time. Before we reach the, the situation where people like Derek don't regularly introduce vulnerabilities, it's going to take decades, I'm sure. Um, but better late than ever, right? So in the meantime, we're going to have to live with a lot of vulnerable systems. And these systems, it's like this cartoon here, they are leaking, there are lots of holes in them, and what we then need to do is we need to have lots of people to plug the holes. And that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing a, uh, a, a big uh, workforce gap, as they call it. So according to this one study, the cybersecurity workforce gap study, we have in the world, I'm not quite sure exactly who they count, we have four and a half million people working in cybersecurity. Um, and we need three and a half million more. In Europe, we have 1.2 million, they say, and we need 300,000 more. And those 300,000 more that we need, that's 60% more than we needed last year. So, so this gap is rapidly increasing. Um, and so here comes then the second important, um, the second important role for uh, academia, educational institutions, universities, and that is education. There's a huge need for education in this area, and I can't see that it's going to uh, diminish anytime soon. So, this is then the, I would say, one way to motivate the existence of cities and uh, similar research and education organizations. Cities and, and academia are needed for better tools and methods to solve this problem in, in the long term and for all the education that we're going to have to, uh, have to do in the meantime while we have all these vulnerable systems that we are so very, very dependent on. All right, so with that, David, I will hand over to you to... Uh, present what CDIS actually does. Perfect. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Perfect, perfect. So, my name is uh, David Olgart, or in English, David Olgart. Doesn't matter which one you choose. 
I'm the vice director of CDIS, uh, together with Pontus, trying to manage uh, the center, together with the faculty, obviously. Uh, I'm also uh, the coordinator for research and development regarding cyber defense within the Swedish Armed Forces, and I'm one of the two li liaison persons to CDIS from the Armed Forces. I'm very happy that you made it here today. Um, some of you may have heard uh, some of this, that, uh, the things I will mention here, but see it as a refresher uh, from what you have forgotten from last year or the year before that. And hopefully there will be some updates as well. As you can see here on the slide, uh, CITIS now uh, consists of several part parties. KTH, the Swedish Armed Forces, the Swedish Defense University, the Swedish Defense Research Agency, the National Defense Radio Establishment, and also the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency. And I will try now to give you a general um, introduction to CDIS. In 2019, uh, the Swedish Armed Forces felt the need to broaden and strengthen the, Swede uh, the ongoing research activities on cyber defense and information security. And among other things, it was imper uh, imperative to prepare for education and training of cy cyber soldiers. So we started to talk to KTH about if that could possibly happen, and uh, nine months later, CIDIS was inaugurated and six PhD uh, projects were launched, funded by the Swedish Armed Forces. The first cohort of conscript cyber soldiers also started to receive their basic cyber security and cyber defense training by CIDIS staff, including Kotehua's course on ethical hacking. By 2021, as I mentioned earlier, the Swedish Defence University, FOS, and the Swedish Defence Research Agency, FOI, became partners of CDIS. By 2022, the Swedish Defence Radio Establishment, FRA, really the Signals Intelligence Agency, and the Swedish Civil Contingency Agency, MSB, became partners of CDIS. Also, in 2022, CDIS, together with FOI and under the project management by the Swedish Defence Material Administration, started to work together on a flagship project, developing a demonstrator of a semi-autonomous cyber defence command and control system, really an artificially intelligent security operations centre. So, and this is a picture of all the persons and individuals involved in getting CDs to work. At the top, you have a general assembly uh, chaired by uh, KTH president uh, Anders Söderholm, together with representatives from the part partners. Then there is a steering group. Uh, chaired by um, Mikael Lindström, the deputy president of KTH, and also with representatives from uh, the partners. And for the day-to-day -day business, uh, there's a management group chaired by Pontus Jonsson, who you just heard. And there are representatives from the different parties there as well. And then on the left side of the screen, you have all the researchers involved in all the projects that are being conducted and ongoing right now. To give you an overview of what is going on right now with regards to research projects, since the inception of CDIS, ongoing research activities and projects have almost two-folded. This proves the point that the competence of the researchers at CDIS are well sought after and that the research is on point. It is broadening and strengthening ongoing research activities outside of CDIS, and it's also contributing to a more resilient and secure Swedish cyber domain, 
with a robust cyber defense posture. The research topics, as you can see here on the screen, uh, and projects include analysis and design of resilient control systems for critical infrastructures, attack simulation for cyber defense, cyber situational awareness, crash testing of IT systems against one another using reinforcement learning, securing the Internet of Things, solve the rather hard problem of how to formally prove that an IT system is secure, as a complement to or instead of accrediting using documents and manual guesstimates. Post-quantum cryptography, study algorithms for post-quantum cryptography with a special focus on lattice-based cryptography. I will not go into detail on that subject because that's beyond me. Um, and also how to prevent denial of service attack or against denial of service attacks. We also study how machine learning can be used to identify side channel vulnerabilities and conduct threat analysis in physical computer devices. That is to uh, better protect secrets stored in computer systems. Also, simulation-based reinforcement learning security operation center for early detection and hacking attempts. Consistent hardening and, and analysis of software supply chains. And as already mentioned, the flagship project, developing a demonstrator of a semi-autonomous cyber defense command and control system. And as I said, this is done together with FOI and FMV with use cases from the military domain. Actually, there will be a workshop tomorrow on that. If you see Fredrik Erling up there, if you wave your hand and you're interested in participating, please reach out to him. Also, very important, as Rolf mentioned, there are posters outside this, and don't forget to visit the posters and engage with the researchers during the coffee breaks and during lunch. On education, ongoing activities and looking ahead. Right now, the third iteration of education of cyber soldiers are ongoing. And we foresee in the future continued development and delivery of basic awareness training for non-cyber personnel and also cutting edge agile education for cyber soldiers, officers, subject matter experts, decision makers, and various stakeholders. But for now, we are focusing on military personnel, but possibly also for others on demand and as deemed appropriate. If you want to know more about education, you can reach out to Gunnar Karlsson, if you please wave your hand, and also Charlotte Riederstråle. Looking ahead then, what is the next phase of CDIS? Obviously, we need to conclude the ongoing PhD projects and other research activities uh, in the term of 2024 and 2025. There's a five missing up there, I can see now. Also, we need to start, define and set up new and exciting cutting-edge projects for 2025 and beyond. Someone has been trying to steal all my letters, I don't know why. Uh, and also, CDS needs to start to collaborate with and contribute to Cyber Campus Sweden. For those of you who were here last year, maybe you remember there was uh, a presentation on the Cyber Campus initiative and also a panel discussion on that subject. But to, to reiterate them, Cyber Campus Sweden uh, is a proposed initiative and planning is ongoing right now. Uh, for, uh, cyber, for a cyber campus that is to carry out agile and cutting-edge research, education and innovation vital for a resilient Sweden that go beyond what is possible for an individual university, institute, agency or company. So it's quite a, a bold mission statement, but we are getting there. And the planning group has been, uh, the planning work has been going on for approximately one year and we have been financed uh, from Vinova 
in order to be able to, to do all the planning that is required. So what is a cyber campus then? Well, we think there are pillars, obviously, uh, to hold up this kind of temple. And the pillars are on agile education, joint research, protected innovation, support for policymakers, EU participation, and international visibility for Sweden, all based on a national cyber defense research infrastructure, uh, and together with all the parties I mentioned, uh, universities, institutes, agencies, and companies. Moving on then, if you want to start to collaborate before the cyber campus has actually been inaugurated, you can collaborate with CIDIS, and you are already doing the first bullet on this slide. You are participating in, in the, this conference. You could sign up for the CIDIS mailing list, you can join contract teaching courses, hold guest lectures for students, initiate master thesis projects, host researcher presentations, participate in joint research applications, like FOI has done, participate in research projects, uh, fund research projects, and also apply for partnership in CDs. And with that, I hope you will uh, really enjoy this day, and I will hand over to Rolf again. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much, David.